Psalm 42. It's uh, always a blessing and a privilege to be here. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to come and address the students and the faculty and uh, board members. Um, it's it's a, a blessing. So we talked last time about the damage that pragmatism has done to our culture, um, last time I was here, and it, its shifting ideas and principles have really impacted just about every part of our lives. Um, and those principles, of course, are uh, developed without any reference to the Word of God or to God himself, and they've produced a society which in many regards is adrift, and that's the word that's often used. 22 years ago in the House of Representatives, uh, Helen Chenoweth Haig of Idaho uh, read into the congressional record uh, the speech of uh, Kootenai uh, County Commissioner Ron Rankin. And in his speech, he read to Congress on the 11th of October uh, in 2000, he said, no one knows better than a veteran, he was a Marine veteran, that service to America does not end when you come home from war. We fought for freedom and we've seen our friends die for freedom, but in spite of the great sacrifices of our fallen patriots of the past, we have become a nation morally adrift, without compass or rudder sacrificing the generations we fought and died for to an enemy we cannot see. Uh, back in 2000, Rankin was uh, seeing the results of a pragmatic worldview uh, touted by godless philosophers and thinkers, and of course fueled by sin and, and uh, egged on by the enemy of all righteousness. And he was realizing, and he goes on in his uh, speech to uh, reference the fact that, uh, that ultimately Satan is at the heart of this uh, spirit of um, principleless pragmatism. Rankin saw the role of social upheaval as the work of Satan, and he saw it particularly as destructive uh, in regards to young people, uh, producing anxiety and depression, and uh, perhaps especially among the young, a sense of despair. So we move the clock forward 22 years, and you may have seen earlier this month there was a report in the New York Post um, there was a, a report there about how many children in New York City are requiring therapy because they've been traumatized by the, the social disorder that surrounds them in that city. Um, the New York Post report says uh, New York City school kids are losing their minds over the zonked out drug addicts and raving vagrants they encounter every day and are flocking to therapists to find ways to cope with the stress the post has learned in neighborhoods such as hell's kitchen quote a lot unquote of kids are now in therapy according to mom katie hamill 43 whose seven-year-old daughter is being treated for anxiety my daughter has seen everything and then she made a list and i'm not going to read the list to you but it's a, a, a an embarrassing <laughs> list and she has if, if you name it she has seen it consistently and constantly. She is in this constant state of panic, said Hamill, who works in real estate. Now, as we observed last time, in, he, or rather in Proverbs chapter 12, and verse, 15, uh, verse 25, it says, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. And Matthew Henry says on these verses that anxiety is the cause and consequence of melancholy. It is a load of care and fear and sorrow upon the, spirit, upon the spirits depressing them and disabling them to exert themselves with any vigor on what is to be done or fortitude in what is to be borne. It makes them stoop, prostrates, and sinks them. Those that uh, are thus oppressed can neither do the duty nor take the comfort of any relation, condition, or conversation. And these children in New York are experiencing this. And so many others are as well, of all ages. And thankfully, we're not in the midst of New York City, glad not, not to be there um, in that sense, but we are in the midst of a cultural shift. 
but it's really uh, exposing us to all manner of sin and injustice and perversion. And it's a culture that is dedicated to loving and worshiping the creature and uh, the creation above the creator. It's one that delights in calling evil good and good evil and putting, of course, uh, darkness for light and light for darkness and bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, as Isaiah 5.20 says. We don't have to look very far to see the face of this change. It's, it's all around us. Here's a quote that uh, illustrates the point about the worship of the creation. As program director of the Unitarian Universalist Ministry for Earth, it is my mission to empower Unitarian Universalists to be a positive force for social transformation and climate justice. <laughs> this spring, our message is to, quote, spring for change, unquote. From today to Earth Day on April 22nd to World Biodiversity Day on May 22nd, I invite you into a season of sacred activism. Every day is an opportunity to deepen our spiritual and daily practices in relationship to this great earth and to participate in the growing movement to create climate justice instead of climate chaos. Oh, here, the sacred activity yeah. of uh, preserving the earth. And of course, the Universalist Unitarian or Unitarian Universalist Church isn't large. It has 170,000 members in a thousand congregations, and they claim to have hundreds of thousands of, of adherents. But, so it's hardly a mainline denomination in that sense. But the OPC and the BPC combined are much, much smaller than, than that. Um, it might be added that uh, the director has been for many years an instructor in this area of climate issues, with this same emphasis of the spiritual character of it in a worldwide organization that involves nearly two million young people. So it's not like she's just involved in this one area of the church. She's also involved in, in a, a public organization uh, where she's uh, bringing these same thoughts to, to young women particularly. Now, it would be profitable to add examples of evil being called good and good being called evil, but there's so many examples, it's hard to know which ones to pick out, and you all know those things. But it's like a flood overtaking us. We've even talked about it a little bit here this morning during, during the prayer time. You try to escape it, but it won't be ignored. Uh, every day it comes in some wave or another. It invades politics, it invades sports, entertainment, business, sco uh, scholarship, religion, and science. They're all impacted by these things. As Job said in, in Job chapter 21, this is verses 11 and 12. It's an interesting comment by Job talking about the wicked. He says, they send out their little boys, um, boys like a flock and their children dance. They sing to the tambourine and the lyre and rejoice to the sound of the pipe. And John Gill, commenting on those verses, says this, of the children of, godless, of the godless, uh, they send their children out not to school to be instructed in useful learning, but into the streets to play and pipe and dance. And it may denote as their number, so their being left to themselves and being at liberty to do as they please, being under no restriction or any care taken of their education, at least in such a manner as to have a tendency to make them sober, virtuous, and useful in life. It's interesting the way things never change. Um, the, they're, they're the people who, who say, uh, as they did in Job's day, depart from us to God. We don't desire the knowledge of your ways. What is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit do we get if we pray to him? Now, all that being said, as the disciples of Jesus Christ, you and I are tasked with pushing aside the nonsense and the noise of the tambourine, the lyre, and the pipe, and the rage, and the mockery of the world. And we're tasked with listening to and heeding the word of God and putting our trust in the Lord and his word, and living by the principles of, of truth that are set down in that word, and doing it um, in, in spite of all that's going on around us. 
with the purpose of being salt and light and uh, to uh, keep uh, the dark and bitter world um, at least um, impacted by, by that salt and light. And it's no small task to do that. Now, God's grace is sufficient for times like this, just like it always has been. Um, it has always been God's grace that has sustained his people. And as we observed last time, believers in every age, even in the days of Calvin and Luther uh, and the other reformers, found it a struggle to um, meet the challenges of casting a sober eye over all this, uh, over all the disappointing, discouraging events of any day, not ignoring them, but, but confronting them seriously and honestly and thoughtfully and not being overwhelmed by them. So we're, we're not the people who say, well, we know all this is going uh, out on or going on in the world, but ignorance is bliss. So we'll just go along in our merry little way and we'll pretend like those things aren't happening. We can't do that. Um, we have to confront them. We have to acknowledge them. We have to deal with them. But it's hard not to be overwhelmed by them. Um, and it's hard not to um, be just washed away by the constant stream of these things and be anchored by our faith and riding over them or standing our ground through them or, or among them. If you've ever done any ocean swimming in heavy waves, you, you know what I mean. You generally have two options. You can confidently ride over the wave, just kind of let it carry you over the top of it, or you can stand your ground and let it crash over you. But those are the only two options. The third option is to be carried off by the wave and, uh, and driven into the bottom of, of the ocean by it. Our day is unique in some regards because the avenues by which all this bad news comes into our lives is constantly available to us. And we can wake up in the middle of the night and uh, look at our phone and see bad news. We can wake up in the middle of the night, turn on TV, and, and we can see bad news. It's, it's just constantly coming all the time. And that brings us to the words of David here in, in Psalm uh, 42 that uh, we've been just sort of touching on. And we're just going to touch on them a little bit this morning, but next time I come, or this afternoon, next time I come, we'll get into them in more detail. But the reason we focus on these is because they're the words of David and the instructions that he gave to his own soul during very uh, difficult and trying times for himself. In Psalm 42, verse 5, he says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. And then again in verse 11, he says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, and I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Now, I'm hoping that the Lord will refresh our minds and hearts a little bit with some thoughts about what it means to trust in the Lord in the times we have together ahead. But I want to begin by just considering these verses very briefly here for just a moment. First, this psalm was written in a very bad time for David. Uh, his whole life had changed dramatically, and it's easy to lose sight of that. Um, he describes himself as a man with a broken and troubled spirit. King Saul, Saul had unjustly banished and unjustly labeled David a criminal. Um, he was probably at the time the least criminal of men in Israel, and yet he was labeled a criminal by, by the king. He was publicly identified as an outlaw. And I've thought of this as I watched the way some of the most unthreatening people in our society have been crim criminalized lately. Um, I'm sure we all saw the, um, the anti-abortion um, uh, individual who was uh, a gentleman, as far as I can tell from everything I've heard, who was uh, um, 
uh, carried off to jail as, as a criminal uh, for merely protecting his, his uh, family. Um, but anyway, for in some cases, just simply for their faith, some have had to suffer that way. David couldn't go home. Not that his brothers would have been much comfort. Um, his brothers were not much support to David. Uh, they accused him of being proud and, and useless in the affair with Goliath. And uh, he could not even worship God in the tabernacle, uh, being in constant jeopardy from Saul at this point. And uh, I always think of that uh, situation with his brothers where I'm sure they arrived in camp in the camp of the Israelites, very proud of who they were, the sons of Jesse. But then when uh, David shows up, they talk about him being the one who keeps the few sheep. And was, were they trying to imply that their father really was in poverty and that uh, he was hardly worthless? I don't think that's what they meant, but their, their hearts were where they were. And David had to suffer that at their hands. At one point, David said that he felt like a flea or a partridge being hunted in 1 Samuel 26, verse 20. But we really get the state of his heart and his mind in the context of the psalm itself. Um, it's the chief musician in a contemplation. Spurgeon says that this is an instructive ode and uh, full as it is of deep experimental expressions. It is eminently calculated to instruct those pilgrims whose road to heaven is of the same trying kind as David's was. But you look at verses 1 through 4, as the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they continually say to me, Where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me, for I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. David's weighed down with anxiety, and he's about to be overwhelmed by it. But uh, by the grace of God, he catches himself and realizes that he's allowing himself to be uh, um, carried off by all these matters and these circumstances. And so uh, in danger of letting them get the upper hand on him, um, he admonishes his own soul in verse 5 and says, why are you cast down that way? And he speaks to himself and corrects himself. But then the wave rolls in again. So you see that here in this psalm. The first roll comes over him, and then the second roll comes after he admonishes himself. And he, he realizes he's in danger of being inundated. And so he cries out in verses 6 through 7 this way, Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore I will remember you from the land of Jordan and from the heights of Hermon, from the hill Maswar. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls, all your waves and billows have gone over me. He's at a critical danger, a critical juncture, excuse me. He's in danger of being swallowed up and carried off by despondency. That's what's getting a grip on him, which in turn is going to drag him away from faith and his trust in God and from his uh, living in a godly way. He's tempted to do that. But the man of faith looks away from all that's weighing down his heart and his soul, and he looks up again to God. And in verse 8 we read, The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? And uh, after he speaks that way with God, and it's a pretty weak prayer. <laughs> I'm going to look up to you. And I'm going to put my confidence in you. Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> is uh, the way he, he speaks. Why are you oppressing me? Um, then he gives the second admonition to his soul in verse 11. So why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil? Look to God. And he employs the best remedy. He chides his soul for it to fear. Um, to take its fears and its doubts and its anxiety and set them aside and charges himself to put his trust in God. Now, I just want to 
cover three things as we close. And um, they're in regards to ourselves and our families and maybe the people we have to minister to um, as we think about this psalm, just the introduction to. The first thing is that anxiety and distress are not easily overcome. Um, look how hard it was for David, the man after God's own heart, the victor over Goliath, in these circumstances to get control of himself. He is expressing to us how difficult it is and uh, declaring it before the Lord. Um, it's important for us to remember that, um, not just for ourselves, but for those who are around us. I know sometimes when I express uh, something that's burdening me or maybe somebody will come and tell me something about the, the, that they've heard or, or that it's, they, they've gotten the news about and they bring it to me their ex expectation is that I'll be prepared to receive it but you don't know what other has other things have been washing over and that might just not be the news you need to hear at that moment and it, it can be overwhelming and so we need to be aware of that that these are, are things that are are difficult to overcome even David impacted by them um, our souls should wait silently for God alone and our expectation from him you know our expectation from him but it's important for us to remember it's difficult and patience and repetition are required, required and warranted. That is, keep telling ourselves, keep admonishing our souls. Don't be overwhelmed by this. Don't be carried away by this. Put your trust in God. Don't be uh, put down as David did here. Secondly, the more spiritually tender the heart, the more powerfully these things tend to sting and burden that heart. The more tender we are in our thoughts of God and what's right and what's good, um, the more powerfully these things weigh on us. Uh, in Psalm 74, Asaph says in verse 10, How long, O God, is the foe to scoff, is the enemy to revile your name forever? Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand? Take it from the fold of your garment and destroy them. He, He's praying for, for God to act, and uh, it's because of a tender heart that he has that desire. God's people, and covenant children especially, are naturally going to be burdened by the seeming triumph of the wicked. And they're going to question, why, why isn't God doing anything? You know, when little children see this and they're exposed to it, uh, young believers... Uh, uh, their question is going to be, why isn't God dealing with them now? Why isn't God working now? Why isn't he arresting them in this wickedness? And it is important that we have their spiritual development in mind and we encourage them in their faith. And we do that by bringing them back to this idea of putting their trust in God and resting in his principles and trusting in his truth. And the third thing is that the spiritual man or woman can, by grace, usually tell when the soul is healthy or when it's becoming distracted and overburdened. In other words, you can use, we can usually tell that for ourselves. And it's important that we deal with that when we sense it developing, not wait and not put it off and not uh, just try to distract ourselves but actually deal with the issues and our relationship to the Lord. In Psalm 86, verse 4, the psalmist says, Gladden the soul of your servant, for you, for to you, O Lord, do I lift my soul. And there's nothing wrong with that prayer. It's an important prayer for, for our souls to be gladdened and uh, to be lifted up in the Lord. In Psalm 94, verses 18 and 19, there the psalmist says, When I thought my foot slips, your steadfast love, O Lord, help me. When the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. And that's what we need to pray for, the, the impact of those consolations, the power of those consolations in our lives, so that we remain cheerful even in the midst of the constant wave of uh, uncheerful news and, and uh, items that come our way. And we encourage others to do the same, to put their trust and confidence in the Lord. And we'll talk more about what that looks like, hopefully, the next time.
come here. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we...